Okay, hello everybody and welcome to stage B. Um, we're going to start off nice and relaxed, so I'm going to introduce myself rather than having a big formal introduction. I'm Katie Eagleton. Please forgive the slightly corporate slides. I last gave this talk on behalf of my work, which is the British Library. Um, on site here, you probably have seen me running around as one of the first aid team. So this is a talk about books, because that's my job. But I'm also around on site as one of the um, EMF crew. So delighted to take an hour out to talk about something else. So at the British Library, I look after a team and collections from Asia and Africa, so from Turkey to Japan to South Africa. And what I'm going to talk about today is some of the ways that that gives me a different perspective on this issue around what the history of the book looks like and what that means its digital future might look like. Um, and I should say it's a talk that grew out of rage at some of the tech journalism which gets a bit overexcited about the death of the book. So it's a sort of thinly disguised response to some of the, the lack of debate and the lack of, of depth in some of the discussions around that. So I thought I'd start with something really predictably exactly like you'd expect a book to be. This is Shakespeare's first folio, the first collected edition of all of Shakespeare's plays. It comes between covers, it's got pages, it turns the pages, you read it, and there are some but not many pictures. That's kind of a classic book and we're really familiar with it if if somebody put this book into your hand I mean they'd be unlikely to because it's really valuable and there's only a certain number in the world but if they did you'd know how to read it you'd know how you as a person related to this object in your hand and I think that's something really important about books they're about people they're not just about the words and the content of them they're about the way people use them and the kinds of things they do with them and arguably, even with a book that's as famous as Shakespeare's First Folio, we don't know enough yet about how readers read it. So the people side of the story isn't always as clear as you'd think. And the story of the book, if you sort of think about the history of the book, typically goes a bit like there was writing, and then there were books, and it was all very inconvenient, and then people came up with this format of the book, the codex with, with boards and pages. But that, for me, is a bit of a Eurocentric story because some of the earliest writing was from China and it wasn't written in books, it was written on bones like this one. This is about 3,000 years old, it's an oracle bone from Shang Dynasty, China. And the really amazing thing about these is they're divinations that tell you whether it's gonna rain or whether you should travel, but they also record the names of the kings of the Shang Dynasty. So they're kind of historical documents as well and they were some of the first proof of the existence of the Shang Dynasty when these things were found. I'm not sure if this is a book. I mean, it's a bone with characters on, but it's some of the earliest writing, and it's one of the earliest things in the British Library collection. And if you think about China, just because I'm trying to keep out of the kind of European mindset a bit here, the next part of the story is books that are written on bamboo strips, like the one I've put up on the screen, with characters running vertically and string holding the bamboo strips together. So they roll up. And you can carry them around. You can get more text onto these. These are basically books. They don't look much like the books that we're used to, but they are. They can contain information, and they can, they can contain lots of different types of things in one book. And of course, once you've got to this format, a sort of scroll format, you can get to things like this, which is a picture of the library cave from Mogao in Dunhuang, which is in northwest China. And about a thousand years ago, these amazing Buddhist caves had an extensive library of scrolls. And in the picture, you can see the scrolls piled up in the library cave. So you unroll them to read them. And that's part of the practice around these caves. They're part of the life of these Buddhists, and they're part of the life of these caves. So this doesn't look very much like a book either, but it is. And this is a library, even though it doesn't look much like a library. And when you get a bit later on in Chinese history, so the Ming Dynasty, 14th, 15th century in the European calendar, you start to get this kind of thing, which is a book. It's a concertina folded page, but it's in bound, and it looks like a book. It feels like a book as we recognize it. And this is actually part of an amazing encyclopedia project called the Yongle Dadian, which was a compilation of all knowledge in the world, and it was in 11,000 volumes. I think actually 11,095 is the current estimate. 
And I say the current estimate because only a fraction of it, we think about 3% of it still survives. And we have 24 of the original 11,000 and odd volumes in the British Library, and this is one of them. But this wasn't a kind of simple process. You can trace it through a bit and say, okay, so writing on bones was a bit inconvenient. Writing on a scroll was better, but still not ideal. And then we got to the book and then everything's okay because the codex form of book, this kind of book with bound edge and covers on it, didn't take off everywhere and it isn't still today the only kind of book that people use. It's not a sort of simple progression to some kind of ideal idea of what the book is. Scrolls endured for a long time. So not everything ends up looking like this. Some things still look like this. These are Hebrew scrolls, um, one that's giant and one that's tiny. Because I think there's something about the scale of these objects that's really important. You know, if you're reading the Torah, which is what both these images are, sometimes you want a big scroll, sometimes you want a tiny one, where actually probably you didn't unroll that tiny scroll to read it. It was about carrying it around with you. And so that, again, I'm sort of saying people and books are what's important here, not just books themselves. But they're quite impractical, both of these. Giant scroll, tiny scroll, they're not very easy to, to use sometimes. And in some cultures, there's been attempts to solve this problem by having these folding books. So they're kind of concertina, and there's a picture of one on the screen here, which is a Malay manuscript, so from Southeast Asia. And it's a Sufi poem. And you can see it's a really beautiful artifact. It's got these characters on it. The picture at the bottom right of the screen is there's some kind of mystical characters on the covers of this concertina book. And it's a really amazing artifact, as well as containing text. There's something about this that these pictures don't really do justice to, because there's more to it than just the characters on the page. This is a book that's more than just a thing that carries words. It's got power as an object as well. And it makes you think also about how people read books. You know, how do you read this? Very thin pieces strung together. It's also a book. This is a saddlebag Quran from West Africa. And it's called a saddlebag Quran because more or less you, well, you can see the bag. It's loose leaves of a book and you can be riding along in the desert in West Africa on your camel and pull out just a single page to read. And this is very typical of West African manuscripts um, of the time. So you're thinking, okay, that's reading on a camel. We've got reading giant scrolls communally. We've got all sorts of different ways people interact with books. There's reading as an individual practice, like the chap on the left here having a, a moment with a book, or reading as a social practice. There's a teacher and a student on the right reading a book together, and you can see the books on the book stand in between them. So there's something about the way people interact with books that's important. And you might read aloud, you might read silently. I love how both these guys on the right are kind of pondering with their fingers on their chin. And this is more reading for leisure. There's, this is a sort of scene in a, in a kind of beautiful environment with lots of people reading and writing. And it's actually a school, we think. But it looks like a pretty nice kind of school, pretty leisured kind of school. Writing, though, isn't only about kind of learning and teaching. It can be powerful. And this is a Senegalese amulet writer. And they're writing, and then the words have power. And the words on these writing boards and these amulets have power even if they're washed off. So you wash the ink off and drink the ink and they have power. So that's getting quite a long way from anything that we might today understand as a book when we think about what we pull off a shelf in a bookshop. And books obviously don't have very many words in them sometimes, but we're pretty happy to call them books still. This is a Burmese manuscript about palace life. And it's illustrated with all these elephants and things. And it's in some ways a lot like a contemporary graphic novel because several elements of the story are together in one picture. There's multiple parts of the story in one image. And the same thing's true of this next picture I'll show you, which is part of an illustrated Ramayana, which is one of the great epic stories of South Asia. And if you look in the middle and to the left, there's a 10-headed demon called Ravana. And he's there in two places, not because there's two of him, but because, again, it's combining elements of the story. You read this like a story, like a book, like text, except you read it from the image. And it's not only the sort of visual elements of books that take us well beyond any idea of the book as just carrying text. This book is a fairly plain thing. 
Um, but it's a devotional manuscript, and part of the devotion around it meant it had to be treated with smoke every time it was read. And that means today, in the British Library, when we open the box it's in, there's a great stench of smoke fills the room. And we've had all sorts of discussions about how to preserve that, and how to preserve that smell, because it's part of the book itself. It's part of the experience of the book. And you wouldn't get that if you just sort of took a picture of it and read it as a digitized copy. So uh, coming back to where I started from, if there's this connection between the way people write and think and the way people use books and the kind of forms books have and the places they have in their lives, we perhaps need to think a bit more broadly about books when we're trying to think about their digital future. I mean, the Kindle's great. It reflects the, the codex. You get a page, you turn pages. It's very much based on that codex format. But it really misses something when you think very broadly about the history of the book, as I like to. And it misses something when you think about the diversity of languages and cultures in the world. This is a map that's the major language groups of the world. And I love it because it gets away from national boundaries and it, it shows you the written cultures of the world. And most of these written cultures either don't have a tradition of books or they do, but it's distinctive. And at the moment, things like this actually are only the European tradition put into a slightly different physical format. They're not very different. And I'd argue they're replicating a lot of what's gone before rather than innovating. So we've got this sort of rather single track thing, rather move from one format to another and then replicating the codex format in things like Kindles. But books are more complicated than that. And I want to just finish with an example that really brings that home for me, which is an art piece by a guy called Michael Mandiberg. And he wanted to comment on big data and I think he was trying to do something really interesting because his point was, if you want people to understand an enormous amount of information, the best way to get them to do that is to get them to think about it as volumes because the analogy of the encyclopedia in multiple volumes gets a sense of scale. And so he was inspired by the idea of the end of print and the idea of the end of the book and Wikipedia somehow represented as volumes, both made the amount of it comprehensible, but also signaled its link to the end of print. So he made this artwork with a number of the volumes actually printed out and made wallpaper for the walls of the gallery, which showing the spines of all the others. And it's a visually impressive piece, and I think the idea behind it's really interesting. But remember I told you about that Chinese encyclopedia from 500 years ago that was 11,095 volumes? Well, this one, printing out the whole of Wikipedia, would be 7,473 volumes. So there's a sense in which we're, we're not even back to the scale of ambition that people had in other places and in other times. And actually, there are more connections between the way the future information looks like going and things that have already gone before, but also opportunities that aren't anywhere in the history of the book. Like If we can think even more broadly about what, what words do what and how people engage with information, we can do something more innovative than just replicating books in digital form. We can find ways to digitize items which aren't important only because of the words on the page, but maybe they smell, or they're tiny, or they're enormous, or they need to be read socially, and try and create some of those experiences around digital objects so that we can really get that sense of what this thing is like, what this object is like, as well as what words it has in it. And that's the kind of thing librarians get excited about. We don't, we don't worry about whether a book's going to be a paperback or an e-book. And at the British Library, we're already archiving the internet. So we're not scared of big data. But we are interested in people and the books and how they will continue to engage with this. And I have a feeling libraries and books will be around for a very long time to come. But they might just look very different in 50 years' time. Thank you. So I just need to check how much time I just took to do that. All oh, right. OK, that was really short. So there's time for questions, if anybody's got any. Is this working? Okay. Is this working? Has anyone got a question? Now I've got technology. Mm -hmm. Hi. Yeah, you said about um, going back to Shakespeare's folio that anyone can pick it up and mm -hmm. know how to use it. Um, how does that work in the age of sort of digital media where a, few, a future civilization comes across a hard disk? Mm -hmm. 
there's like how do they start decoding that and yeah. kind of so you know do you worry about kind of the loss of um, long-term access to work yeah we do librarians are really worried about digital preservation because mm -hmm. it's not only about legacy media you know finding a floppy disk or finding something that you try to extract it's also about somehow replicating the experience of viewing it because if you can get a document that was I don't know created in WordPerfect one something gloriously vintage and you can convert it so that it displays it might look very very different on the screen than it did on the original computer it was first written on and so there's a lot of work going on around emulation to try and make sure people sort of don't only have the content but have the it's something of the experience of looking at it and working with it and digital preservation also we do a lot of work with around um, making sure what we've digitized stays and what we've got as digital content stays and the good example there is the web archive, where the British Library, I think most of you are aware of the Internet Archive in the United States, but the British Library archives by legal deposit. So we have the legal right to scrape up the UK Internet, which means, for example, when a political party changes its policies and wipes its website, we've got it, and they can't make us delete it, whereas they can make the Internet Archive delete it, and we're quite proud of that. But that also means we've got a huge responsibility to make sure that that is preserved, because if we have the only copy, because, say, a political party has tried to delete that from the record, we've got to make sure it survives. And so there's huge work going on to, to do that, to replicate it. And in fact, the, the web archive is in, I think, six different locations across the country, so that if something happened to London, it's still there. It's distributed nationally. And we did some studies on old links in the web archive and found that within a year or two, 10% don't work anymore. So that's the other element of this, is trying to collect all of that while it's still there so that we can understand how information changes online. So it's not a static kind of archiving, but it's about understanding how this is changed by people and how it decays. And it's part of the interesting thing about it. Well, well, you know where to find me if you do have questions. If you want to nerd out about libraries or about first aid, you can find me in the first aid tent. Um, and I will encourage you all to look at the British Library's webpage where you can see lots of digitized items. And there's a blog for the Asian and African Department which has almost all of these objects I showed you, so you can find more there. And that's me on Twitter in case you want to get hold of me. Thank you.